first one I've chosen to discuss is the systemic medical diseases associated with that have cardiac involvement. And we can, this is by no means a comprehensive overview of every disease that involves the heart, but what I was hoping to do was pick the most commonly seen of these processes. Um, many of you will accuse me of picking the zebras, but I think for the purposes of boards, sometimes the zebras are nice to have in the back of your mind, especially even with patient management, because they do tend to stand out in the questions. They have to give you the sort of characteristic way that these unusual processes will present. And that's what I hope to highlight here today. Amyloid heart disease is one of those kind of very rare diseases, but you really don't want to miss it when you see it. It's a disease that can be caused by multiple other diseases such as multiple myeloma or even primary amyloidosis. There's an amyloidosis of sen senility that comes on in our aging population that we're beginning to see a lot more commonly. And it involves the uh, extracellular deposition of insoluble immunoglobulin type proteins into the, in between the myocytes. This um, disease process in general, especially with primary amyloidosis, involves other organs including the heart, the liver, the kidney, and, and the GI tract. And even tissues such as nervous tissues, in fact a common uh, complaint will be a patient who presents with vocal hoarseness or carpal tunnel syndrome and congestive heart failure. So those are kind of the ways patients might present on, on testing situations. Amyloid uh, heart disease presents with signs of congestive heart failure. It's actually a disease primarily of diastolic dysfunction, so the patient that you'll send to the echo lab because you're worried about congestive heart failure will come back with the reading of LVH, and I put this in quotes because left ventricular hypertrophy in this situation is really a misnomer. It's actually increased wall thickness of the, of the heart reflective of the infiltration of these proteins into the myo, uh, in between the myocytes. And the ECG will be characteristically either normal or low voltage. There are exceptions to this in clinical practice, but for the purpose of boards, I think if you see a low voltage ECG with an echo which suggests uh, LVH, be suspicious of amyloid disease. The diagnosis is made most commonly nowadays with, by fat aspirate, but in, in, if you're uncertain or if the fat aspirate comes back um, negative, you can go on to a myocardial biopsy. This is a characteristic echocardiogram. You see the left ventricular wall thickening. You don't see the RV very well here, but the RV or the right ventricle will also be thickened. The valves will become thickened, um, which shows up here best, um, and the systolic function, at least early on in the disease, will be preserved. Cardiac sarcoidosis is another disease of a granulomatous disease that has multi-system involvement, as you know. When the cardiac system is involved, it's only in about five percent less than 5% of the cases, and these patients will present with congestive heart failure again. And when you send them to the cath lab, uh, because the echoes will sometimes show regional wall motion abnormalities, their epicardial coronaries will be normal. The diagnosis is, can be made by right ventricular uh, endocardial biopsy. Echocardiography can sometimes suggest the disease, but if the test is asking you what to order next and you suspect cardiac involvement by circo, get an MRI because it really does show this sort of patchy infiltration which you see in the uh, myocardium. And here's an example of the granulomatous infiltration, and you can see it's very patchy. And you'll get a regional wall motion abnormality that doesn't actually follow the usual distribution of the coronaries. Another thing to watch out for on the boards is heart block. You'll get these atypical regional abnormalities, but they'll generally describe heart block, and that again is those granulomatous, um, non-casing granulomas getting involved in the conduction system. And you may have a pericardial effusion, although it rarely uh, causes tamponade. Hemochromatosis, again, multiple organ involvement, liver, heart, gonads, pancreas, skin. There's intracellular deposition of iron in these cases, in these cases and it's directly toxic to myocytes. Cardiac involvement um, will characteristically uh, show you a combined restrictive, in other words, the iron uh, infiltration and ill myocytes will become stiff and so the heart has trouble filling, but it will also be uh, associated with a dilated cardiomyopathy and a reduced ejection fraction. And these patients have severe congestive heart failure and this may be associated with both ventricular and uh, atrial arrhythmias.
This is an example of a pathology specimen from a patient with uh, hemochromatosis, and you can see that both the right ventricle and the left ventricle are markedly dilated, and that there's this brownie, a brown sort of infiltration in the cells, which represents the iron that you see on uh, staining. So keep in mind, dilated cardiomyopathy, the walls, it'll be global left ventricular dysfunction and usually right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, you make the diagnosis by looking for elevated iron and ferritin, and if you're still not convinced, you can get it on a biopsy. And keep in mind the tetrad of congestive heart failure, diabetes, the bronze-skinned patients, and hepatic failure. Carcinoid, as you all know, is a, a carcinoid tumor is a malignancy which can be involved with a clinical syndrome called carcinoid syndrome. The malignancy itself is quite slow growing and the tumors actually produce uh, uh, 5-hydroxyindoacetic acid or 5-HIAA which leads to fr flushing, wheezing, and diarrhea in the clinical symptoms. Now when the heart becomes involved, uh, it can only happen if there's pulmonary or liver metastases, and that's because the serotonin-like uh, substance that causes myocardial damage is metabolized by both the lungs and the liver. So once you have liver metastases, this uh, substance can then affect the right-sided uh, valves, usually in uh, heart, and destroys the valve tissue. It's very toxic to the valves. And it only will affect the left side if there is some shunting going on from right to left. Carcinoid tumor uh, typically involves a tricuspid valve, and I think you'll appreciate this thickened valve uh, specimen that shows this very heavy white infiltration of the valve, and there's scarring and uh, tethering of the uh, usually very thin chordae tendinae. In the pulmonary valve here, I think you can appreciate it's much thicker than normally it would be. It's even thicker than the pulmonary root, although there is some infiltration down here even along the root, and it will eventually destroy the root of the pulmonary valve as well. In the echocardiogram, the leaflets of the tricuspid valve become stiff, and they, this could be a systolic or a diastolic frame. It doesn't matter. These leaflets won't move. They're just sitting out there waving. At, well, they don't move, but they're just sitting out there in the way of the blood flow. So the right ventricle and right atrium become a common chamber, and you get this marked enlargement. Look at the fact that the right ventricle is actually bigger than the left ventricle, which is the reverse of the normal. So you have a thick, immobile tricuspid valve. A big V wave on physical exam will tip you off to this giant regurgitant lesion, an accentuated A wave suggesting, if the patient's still in normal rhythm, that there's high pressures in the right atrium. And you can see this big jet torrential tricuspid regurgitation noted when you put the color flow on the echocardiogram. Hypereosinophilic syndrome, again, another um, syndrome that can be caused by multiple diseases. In general, in, it involves younger male patients, less than 50, and it can cause cardiac involvement anytime the, there is a persistent eosinophilia of greater than 1,500. What we're look, the disease processes are, as I said, anything that raises the eosinophil count it can be idiopathic hypereosinophilia, Loeffler's endocarditis. It can be a reactive allergic type of thing, sometimes involved with neoplasms, especially leukemia. And Schurg Strauss syndrome has been seen to cause this type of a cardiac manifestation. The cardiac uh, involvement and causes a restrictive cardiomyopathy, valvular dysfunction because of the infiltration of the eosinophils, which I'll show you in a minute. And the patients will present with myocarditis, arrhythmias, conduction defects, and fatigue due to congestive heart failure. Now what you'll notice here on the pathology specimen is that this uh, mitral valve has become totally tacked down to the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And in the beginning, when the, early on when the eosinophils are high, they cause damage and erosion of the uh, endocardial surface. This causes a, re causes a reaction of a thrombus formation in both the right ventricular and left ventricular apices and characteristically underneath the valve leaflets, ultimately leading to scarring down of the valve leaflets and the restrictive stiff ventricles that are typically small and when you see them on echo, the chamber size is very tiny because of this thrombus and scarring. Hyperthyroidism is one that's sure to show up on the boards multiple times. When the heart gets involved, it becomes a hyperdynamic heart. There's increased heart rate, increased systolic blood pressure, and increased cardiac output. There's 
this leads to exacerbation of underlying coronary disease because you've increased the myocardial oxygen demand, not surprisingly. But also, um, you can see some positional hypotension due to a decrease in the peripheral vascular resistance. So you have systolic hypertension, but the diastolic blood pressure may be low, even abnormally low, and these patients might present with orthostatic symptoms. Atrial fibrillation is very common in patients, especially our elderly patient population. In about 25% of patients who present with atrial fibrillation, I'm sorry, 25% of patients who have hyperthyroidism will present with atrial fibrillation. So always look for occult hyperthyroidism in the presence of atrial fibrillation. It should always be the first blood test that we order on those patients. And keep in mind that these patients are at increased risk of systemic embolization and that should, they should not be cardioverted until they are euthyroid. Hypothyroidism will lead to cardiac enlargement. It causes infiltration of the myocytes with mucin or mucin, uh, mucoprotein infiltration. It leads to decreased contractility of the heart, which can be reversible if it's caught early, so that's an important feature. And it also leads to um, increased cholesterol and can lead to accelerated atherosclerosis. Systemic lupus, again, multi-system involvement, not surprising. Cardiac involvement, pericarditis, myocarditis, valvulopathy, coronary arteritis, Liebman Sachs endocarditis. And I'll just say a couple words about Liebman Sachs endocarditis. These are generally non-infective vegetations that can be picked up by echocardiography. They're generally quite small. The interesting thing is that about maybe even up to 50% of patients with lupus will show with some of these vegetations if you, if you have a good enough resolution on your echocardiogram or transesophageal echo. They rarely embolize, and that's important because people always want to know whether they should place these patients on anticoagulation, and we typically don't unless there's been a clinical um, occurrence. And they don't interfere generally with valve function, so they just happen to be a phenomenon that we picked up. Um, Non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis occurs in patients with hypercoagulable states or perineoplastic syndrome, and this is important because these um, type of things look very similar on echo and on pathology to the Liebman-Sachs endocarditis. The difference is these are prone to embolize, so these patients do need systemic anticoagulation. Scleroderma leads to thickened skin, dysphagia, and Raynaud's, as you all know. Cardiac involvement is the third most common cause of mortality in these patients behind pulmonary hypertension and renal disease. The cardiac system is involved uh, sort of indirectly by the pulmonary hypertension, which leads to right-sided failure um, in core pulmonale. Scleroderma can also lead to heart failure due to uh, direct vasculitis, and it can cause intramural coronary involvement, immune endothelial injury, and these uh, types of uh, vasculitides are, tend to be associated with a patient who has Raynaud's phenomena. The myocarditis is, is associated with the peripheral uh, myopathy seen in scleroderma, and you can see conduction defects in up to 20% of patients with scleroderma. Pericardial effusion again is often seen, again not usually commonly uh, causing tamponade. Rheumatoid arthritis can cause a number of uh, manifestations outside of the joints, as you all know. Cardiac involvement includes pericardial, uh, pericarditis, which will be classically low glucose, um, and is generally associated with patients who have a nodular rheumatoid arthritis. They can also get a granuloma myocarditis, so these granulomas uh, cause infiltration into the myocytes and dysfunction of myocardium due to scarring in that area and they can cause valvular dysfunction on the same basis. You can get a coronary arteritis and an aortitis. Aortic root dilatation is also seen in ankylosing spondylitis, osteogenesis imperfecta, very unusual disease, and Marfan syndrome. Just a few words about ankylosing spondylitis. This is an example of the uh, type of aortic root specimen you might see in a patient who suffers from this. These patients present with lumbar spine and uh, sacroiliac arthritis, as you know. The aortic root becomes involved in the connective tissue process, and this leads to aortic root dilatation and therefore aortic valve incompetence or regurgitation. The intima here was wrinkled, and I just wanted to point that out because of the aortitis that's involved, and the cusp will become distorted and retracted for the same process. Osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones, blue sclera, and deafness. 
it's a lack of collagen supporting matrix and this will also lead to degeneration of elastic structures and therein lies a problem with the aortic root which leads to aortic dilatation, aortic regurgitation, similar to what we see in ankylosing spondylitis but they'll give you these different features of presentation. And the mitral annulus can be dilated. The mitral valve uh, is classically will prolapse in this situation, and you get chordal stretch, and this can lead to significant mitral regurgitation. So osteogenesis imperfecta can affect two of the cardiac valves. Marfan syndrome, arachnodactyly, tall stature, pectus excavatum, as you know, kyphal scoliosis, and lenticular dislocation. It's an important uh, disease process from a cardiovascular specialist uh, point of view because it does uh, typically lead to dil significant dilatation of the aortic root. It can be associated with mitral valve prolapse and, and aortic regurgitation. Um, it causes an increased risk of aortic dissection, and this dissection can be anywhere, even in the areas of the aortic uh, aorta that are not dilated or aneurysmal. And it's generally felt uh, the best treatment is to try to decrease the, uh, the DPDT or the strain of the flow on the aorta by using beta blockers. And we generally recommend no pregnancy because even once the ascending aorta dilatation has been repaired, the rest of the aorta is still at risk for, uh, for dissection. And this is pronounced during the pregnancy process when other connective tissues are stretching and it gets worse during that period of time. One, uh, this is not really a systemic disease, but I took the liberty of putting this in because last year I sat through this course and I didn't see anything on it. And I think there are some questions about cardiac trauma. Um, cardiac trauma can cause a contusion acutely, and this can be associated with arrhythmias, elevated cardiac enzymes, even transient regional wall motion abnormalities, and these two are generally seen together. It can cause a pericardial effusion and lead to tamponade and it can cause transection or disruption of the aorta, aortic dissection, and even uh, usually the right-sided valves can be dis uh, can it potentially be disrupted if trauma is significant enough, and this can include things such as falling off a horse, not just automobile accidents. There's another type of cardiac trauma that's less well understood, um, comedocordiae, and this is an instantaneous cardiac arrest, and it's generally associated with a non-penetrating blow to the chest, generally the sternum. And it can be uh, associated with in relatively young patients with no underlying cardiovascular diseases. It, it, what it exactly happens is that some trauma occurs during the vulnerable phase of the electrocardiogram, and we define that as 15 to 30 milliseconds before and after the T wave. and um, the patient will have a, a sudden cardiac arrest. And the reason I put a baseball player here is because it was first described in Little League baseball um, situations where uh, even a parent is pitching to a young child and the, and the child steps into the ball and it gets hit in the chest and everyone observing this situation noted that the ball wasn't thrown particularly hard or anything like that. It was just that it occurred at the wrong time and probably in the wrong place. Now, I'm gonna actually switch completely here um, to my second topic. You know, a congenital heart disease in this country is a growing phenomenon. We've become so um, good in the cardiac surgery field at repairing these defects that between 7 and 12 out of 1,000 live births will uh, have congenital heart disease, and 85% of those now are surviving into adulthood, which by this year, was, there were estimates that over a million adults in the United States alone would have adult congenital heart disease. And these lead to considerations uh, for internists in terms of pregnancy and acquired diseases. Now I tried to, I'm not going to cover all of congenital heart disease. I'm going to cover the things that I think you are likely to see. And those really include bicuspid aortic valve, which every one of you probably has seen, will see, and continue to see. And uh, ASD and VSD and a couple of other ones. And just a few words about Eisenmengers. My cuspid aortic valve, as you know, is the most common adult congenital heart disease. It occurs in about 1 to 2 percent of live births, and there's a male predominance uh, that's associated with coarctation of the aorta. Now, a small percentage of patients with bicuspid aortic valve will have coarctation. That should be ruled out in all patients with bicuspid aortic valve. 
and there is a risk of endocarditis. And I placed a normal um, aortic valve up here for you to see the nice thin aortic leaflets that are uh, very pliable and open quite widely to get out of the way of the high velocity blood flow leaving the ventricle. And here below is uh, fusion between these two cusps leading to the bicuspid valve and you can't really make it out very well but there's a little what we call raffe there and these leaflets can't open up as well as these leaflets did and they tend to be tented when the, uh, aorti when the aortic valve opens and therefore they have a lot more wear and tear on the valve. The bicuspid aortic valve over time will lead to either aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, or a combination of these two. And if you look at this series from Dr. Edwards here at the Mayo Clinic, you can see that there's a real predominance of aortic stenosis over time. Um, and it tends to start to occur even in the uh, fourth to fifth decade is when we start to see the peaks. And that's in contradistinction to degenerative aortic valve disease, which we start to see in the 60s and really, really comes to a head in the 80s, uh, late 70s and 80s. Because predominance of aortic stenosis exists, I thought I'd spend just a minute on aortic stenosis. And you should note that any time there's a murmur, you have to worry about sub subacute bacterial endocarditis, and these patients deserve prophylaxis. If there is actually physiologic stenosis, you can uh, lead to some dilatation of the ascending aorta, and obviously left ventricular hypertrophy. Left ventricular hypertrophy will uh, lead to dyspnea. So will the amount of stenosis and the decreased blood flow leaving the heart. In addition, you'll have exertional chest pain, although let's keep in mind that up to 50% of these patients may have coexistent coronary disease and that needs to be excluded once the patient is over 40 years of age. Um, there is also abnormal relaxation associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, ultimately leading to heart failure and syncope and arrhythmias. The murmur of a bicuspid aortic valve is a little bit different than degenerative uh, aortic disease in that you have this signal right here, this sound right here, which is an ejection click. It's an early systolic sound following the S1. It's high pitched and it's usually best heard along the sternal border, although it can be heard at the apex. And in mild aortic stenosis, you'll have normal S1 and ejection clicks, uh, mid-systolic murmur, and then ejection quality murmur. Note the diamond shape signifying the uh, crescendo, decrescendo, ejection quality murmur with a normal physiologically split A2P2 during inspiration. Now as the bicuspid stenosis gets worse, you may lose the sound, although it's possible that it may still be there, but it probably will get a little bit softer. Your murmur moves later, the, the peak of the murmur moves much later into systole and you ultimately get delayed closure of the aortic valve so that you can actually get paradoxical splitting of the uh, second heart sound. Coarctation of the aorta is a very important entity, although most of the time we pick it up in early childhood and it's important because if you repair them early on, they have a better survival than those that we pick up as adults um, and repair them. But 70% of these patients will present with hypertension, and it may be severe in up to 25%. And even if we did repair them early on, there's still about a 3% chance that you and I will see them later in life um, when they have a restenosis of the coarcted aorta re requiring uh, re-repair or reoperation. Here's a pathology example of a classic coarctation of the aorta. You see the aortic arch vessels, great vessels here, the aortic arch, and then just at the ligamentum arteriosum, just beyond the subclavian, left subclavian artery, you see this discrete narrowing of the aorta and then a postenotic dilatation. We can diagnose uh, these patients because of their presentation of hypertension. They'll have a delayed femoral arterial pulse. So when you take the wrist pulse and the femoral pulse simultaneously, the femoral pulse will be slightly delayed from the radial pulse or the brachial pulse. They'll also have chest x-ray rib notching. They may have a murmur on examination. Typically it's a systolic murmur, but it may last into diast diastole as well. It's associated with a bicuspid aortic valve in up to 80% of patients. So though bicuspid aortic valve is only associated with a very small percentage of patients that have coarctation, in other words, if they present with bicuspid aortic valve, a small percentage of those patients will have a coarct. If you find a coarct, up, most up to 80% of patients will have a bicuspid aortic valve. It's also associated with cerebral aneurysms of the circle of Willis and aortic dissection.
and the risk of aortic dissection persists even after repair. Um, and this is just to make the point that most of these patients are picked up early on in life, but hopefully if we won't miss them if they happen to be missed earlier by our colleagues. And they can get worse over time as well if they calcify. So even someone that had a mild stenosis early on may progress later in life. Again, the complications of coarctation are aortic rupture, aortic dissection, left ventricular failure due to the pressure overload on the left ventricle, and endocarditis. And they, can also, and they also have been associated with premature coronary disease, even in patients with repair. And you'd think that the coronary disease might have been because of the hypertension, but even those patients that have normal tension after repair seem to have premature coronary disease for reasons that are unclear. This is a classic chest x-ray of a patient with coarctation. And I think if we can have, uh, can you all see the rib notching right here? It's on all of the ribs, but it really shows up best on this rib right here. On the inferior aspect of the, of the ribs, you'll see where there's been hypertrophy of the collateral intercostal arteries, which causes um, some remodeling of the ribs and leads to this uh, rib notching, which you can pick up on chest x-ray, even though the rest of the chest x-ray in this particular patient was relatively unremarkable. Here's a typical angiogram of the aortic arch showing the normal arch, normal um, uh, great vessels, and then the narrowing that I showed you on the pathology specimen with the post stenotic dilatation. Pulmonary valvular stenosis, um, again, you probably won't see this, on, maybe not see this on the boards. It is associated with Noonan syndrome, and the boards seem to like those things that are associated with, so they can test you on two things at once. But, um, and Noonan syndrome is a mild mental retardation, uh, short stature, broad faces, um, and short webbed neck. Uh, these patients present with dyspnea, fatigue, and syncope, because, and similar uh, to the way patients with aortic stenosis will present. And on exam, and the main reason I brought this up is because uh, the pulmonary valve is also can have an ejection click when it opens and when, it's, when you have pulmonary valve stenosis. It's the only right-sided heart sound that's louder with expiration. Remember that most right-sided heart sounds will get louder with inspiration because the volume to the right side of the heart gets bigger with inspiration. But when you have a, a stenotic valve, the uh, inspiration causes the valve to start to open a little bit before, during inspiration, and so the valve excursion is less during inspiration, so the click opening during inspiration is less. But if you just remember, you can uh, go back and teach your residents this. Uh, it's a trick question on you know, clinical rounds and things like that, that it's the only right-sided sound that gets louder with expiration. That's the pulmonary ejection click. You also note a prominent A wave in the jugular venous pressure, again reflecting that high right-sided pressure during atrial contraction. There'll be a soft, delayed uh, P2 systolic ejection murmur, which again will get louder uh, during inspiration due to increased flow. And you'll see right ventricular hypertrophy on the, right, uh, on the ECG. It, this can be treated pretty easily with balloon valvuloplasty and it's diagnosed by echocardiography. Um, atrial septal defect is a chronic left to right shunt. And here you see the different positions of the atrial septal defect. 75% of them, the most common, is a secundum atrial septal defect, which occurs in the middle, right at the fossa ovalis. There's also uh, a superior uh, vena cava um, ASD and a primum ASD, which occur down lower. 75% of patients will present before the age of 75, but it's common for these to go undiagnosed until adulthood. And how will patients present? They'll show up with atrial fibrillation uh, or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Sometimes they'll have signs of volume overload and congestive heart failure. They can present with paradoxical emboli or severe pulmonary hypertension causing uh, Eisenminger syndrome. Only, only about 8% of patients with ASD will end up with Eisenminger syndrome and severe pulmonary hypertension, which we'll talk about in a few slides. One point I'd like to make at this, at this juncture is that 
So condom ASD and Peyton uh, Foramenal Valley, um, in some ways, are, it's a little bit academic to try and distinguish those, and I don't think that that would be something that you might want to try and distinguish on the boards. Generally, Peyton Foramenal Valley is present in about 25% of people sitting in this room. It's a potential hole where the fossil vallus membrane overlaps and closes, which generally happens the minute the, the baby takes its first few breaths at birth because the pressures on the left side of the heart go up high and then push that membrane together eventually it should close shut tight but in about 20 to 25 percent of us it doesn't. Both of these can be both PFO or Peyton uh, Freeman ovalis and per, um, ASD can be associated with paroxysmal emboli. In general ASDs are bigger and I think that's all you really need to remember. Uh, we, we argue a lot sometimes in the echo lab whether one's in PFO or an ASD when they get big but it's not that important. Now the interesting thing here is this is a normal heart. This is a heart with a long-standing secundum atrial septal defect right here. And what you'll note is the left ventricles are about the same. The left atrium is a little bit bigger here. But look at the marked enlargement of the right side of chambers due to the chronic volume overload of the right heart. So the chronic left to right shunt uh, leads to this fixed or uh, widely split S2. Right ventricular volume overload, which you'll pick up on physical exam as a right ventricular lift. The pulmonary artery ejection systolic murmur, that's because of the volume overload. There's a big volume of blood going through the pulmonary artery right underneath the sternum, the sternum and then the pulmonary artery. That's when you get stabbed in the sternum, you cut your pulmonary artery. That's why we hear pulmonary uh, murmurs so well. Um, and then the tricuspid diastolic rumble, again, volume overload across the tricuspid valve, which is generally heard best when the patient's in uh, sinus rhythm, and an elevation of jugular venous pressure. You also note on the chest x-ray that you'll have increased right atrium, right ventricular, and pulmonary artery uh, enlargement, which you can see for some reason, my slides are getting cut off just on that side. I'm not sure what's causing that. But um, you see the generosity of the, the right-sided heart uh, uh, structures as well as the enlarged uh, pulmonary arteries. And this patient does not have Eisenmenger syndrome. It was just a normal ASD. So if you see a big plethora of pulmonary arteries, wonder about um, ASD. Atrial septal defects can also be associated with some things. Again, I mentioned secundum is the most common. Generally, the ECG will show a right bundle branch block and right axis deviation due to the right-sided chamber enlargement. The sinus phenosis uh, ASD, that's the one that's up there by the superior, ve uh, um, uh, yeah, superior vena cava. <laughs> Sometimes you forget what you're going to say when you're in front of so many people, you know. Um, and that's associated with anomalous pulmonary vein. Uh, and, and again, I don't, these are more for uh, cardiology specialists, but they might bring something like that up on board as a discriminator. Um, the one I wanted to point out is the osteum primum is associated with a cleft mitral valve and Down syndrome. And again, um, left axis deviation on the ECG suggesting left anterior hemi block. Coronary sinus ASD is very rare, and I wouldn't even worry about that one for internal medicine boards. Um, repair of ASD improves long-term survival and limits progression to congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And it's generally recommended if you discover an ASD in a patient who's less than 40 years old that would be low risk for surgery, they have symptoms or they have evidence of volume overload on either their chest x-ray or their echocardiogram. Now there have been uh, some discussion about using these percutaneous closure devices, which um, we've been using here and I think people across the country have been. No one knows the long-term uh, sequelae of these and we don't have any really long-term uh, data uh, comparing these to those patients with surgery and I think that for right now they probably won't ask us any questions, but for clinical practice these can be considered and in our general uh, recommendations are if the patient's at high risk for surgery then think about a closure device. And these closure devices, by the way, have also been used for patent ductus arteriosus. Ventricular uh, septal defects are also common. And we see them a lot in newborns, and as you may know, they close spontaneously in up to 60% of patients. These are generally the smaller muscular ones and are less common for the larger, larger ones. Membranous ones rarely close. And 
VSDs are classified anatomically as either mem membranous or muscular and physiologically by their size and their pulmonary artery pressure and that's what we have to pay attention to on whether we can close them or not in the congenital heart disease clinic. There are common congenital heart disease that we see in adults, often seen with Down syndrome. Sometimes they do go undiagnosed until patients uh, become adults. Um, there doesn't seem to be a gender difference. And if you have an adult with a VSD, they're either going to be a small VSD, which we characterize as restrictive, and that means that the, they're so small that they're not allowing too much blood to go across from left to right in that shunt, and that means that the PA pressure or the pulmonary artery pressure is still going to be normal. If they're large VSDs, then they're more than likely, and you're dealing with an adult, they're going to have severe pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis, which is Isominger syndrome. All patients with VSDs need to be on SPE prophylaxis, and that's, uh, I'm not sure I mentioned it or not, but ASD, secundum ASD, does not need to be prophylaxed for bacterial endocarditis. And that comes up quite often, bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis questions on the boards. These are different locations. In the interest of time, I think I'll move on. Here's an example of a membranous VSD in a patient who has a thickened right ventricular wall, left ventricle, left atrium and aorta. And you can see this defect between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, signifying a membranous ventricular septal defect. Isominger syndrome is important for us as internists to understand because it is associated with severe pulmonary artery hypertension. That is actually the definition of it. It's due to a congenital heart disease in which the shunt has uh, become reversed. It can happen with ASDs, as I said, about 8% of the time, but most commonly when we see it in adults, it's because of an undetected ventricular septal defect. And babies that have ventricular septal defects that are huge, and it depends on the size, can develop the um, Isominger syndrome before they hit their teen years, and some can develop it even before they're one or two, depending on the size of the ventricular septal defect. It can be associated with other congenital heart diseases. I don't want to lead you astray to make you think that these are the only two, but when we see it, in, as adults and detected as a first-time diagnosis is generally either an ASD or an undetected VSD. Interestingly, the mean life expectancy is not as short as you might think. From your experience with primary pulmonary hypertension, you know their long-term uh, survival is less than about five years. But um, with patients with uh, Isominger syndrome, they can live. Uh, we've had some patients in their 70s with Isominger syndrome. Uh, their functional class will depend on their right ventricular function, their tricuspid regurgitation, or their pulmonary regurgitation, and their other associated lesions. This is an example of Isominger's VSD, which is the most common Isominger syndrome we see. And what you'll note here is that you have high volume coming from left to the right ventricle through the ventricular septal defect. And then because there's sort of a common chamber here, you get this marked volume overload into the fragile pulmonary vasculature, which leads to thickening of the pulmonary arterial, arterioles and ultimately stiffening of these, leading to irreversible pulmonary vascular disease and cyanosis. And you can see that you have blue blood coming in from the right ventricle mixing with oxygenated blood and both these mixing chambers go out through the various either the aorta or the pulmonary valve and that'll lead to physical signs of clubbing and some peripheral cyanosis first but ultimately central cyanosis um, on examination. Cyanotic heart disease is very complicated. It leads to uh, significant cardiac, pulmonary, hematological, central nervous system, vascular, and renal disease. I don't have time. This is a whole lecture we give to our residents uh, to go into all these. One thing I do want to point out is that t there is a tendency, and we've seen it here a number of times, to phlebotomize patients with these high hematocrits. If you're given an option to do that on the boards, don't unless the patient has symptoms. And that's true in clinical practice, too, because this uh, elevated hematocrit may be markedly elevated and is a compensatory mechanism to help carry more oxygen in the blood because of the cyanosis. They'll also have some renal insufficiency and peripheral vascular disease. Patients with cyanosis and Isomaker syndrome should avoid high altitudes because it causes desaturation, dehydration, isometric exercise because it may worsen the left, uh, the left, right to left shunting, um, and um, pregnancy is really pretty much contraindicated. Patent ductus arteriosus is usually found in childhood associated with a number of things including coarctation of the aorta, maternal rubella, altitude, pregnancy at an altitude. 
Um, it's generally seen as a machine, pick up as a machinery murmur. That's the way it's described, and that's the little zebra that you should look for in the history. Ultimately, in a, results in a wide pulse pressure and left ventricular volume overload, hyperdynamic left ventricular apex in an S3. Now, the anatomy behind this is that you have the aortic arch here, and there's a connection between the patent ductus arteriosus, which should close within the first 24 hours after birth, and the pulmonary artery. And you can see the pathology specimen here. Pa pregnancy, um, and this does come up on the board sometimes, is so uh, it should be discussed with your patients. If they have Eisenmenger syndrome, it's uh, really a contraindication of pregnancy as maternal mortality is 50%. Patients with severe obstructive lesions, such as aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy also have high maternal mortality. And uh, in fact, I forgot to mention in Eisenmenger's that nearly uh, very rare, I mean, I, I have not seen or heard of a case of pregnancy being completed in Eisenmenger's. I mean, they just have premature births. The babies are very cyanotic and don't do well in that environment. Left ventricular dysfunction. Um, also, if they're in New York Heart Association class 3 to class 4, again, high maternal mortality. In Marfan syndrome, although I don't have a number for you, again, I've already told you that dissection is con of a huge concern, and so we generally recommend no pregnancy, and especially if the aortic root is greater than 40 millimeters. Uh, I think that's it for my slide. Just keep in mind that uh, use all the tools that they give you on the examination, chest X or ECG history, physical examination. The history is really helpful in these situations because they're going to have to give you one of those little clues that sets off the cascade of thinking in these situations. Don't, uh, in real life, we generally use a huge team of people to manage these very complicated patients. Um, and I may see some of you taking the exam this fall up in uh, Minneapolis if you're taking it there because I'm going to be taking my recertification. So good luck and I wish myself the same. Question one is a 42-year-old female stockbroker who presents with gradual dyspnea on exertion. She has a history of murmurs since she was a child. She's noted gradual fatigue over the last year and within this time frame has had to give up jogging due to shortness of breath, which she blamed on her busy lifestyle, relative deconditioning, and increasing age. She now notes dyspnea with climbing stairs and if she tries to carry anything heavy. She denies syncope, chest pain, orthopnea, and PND. Physical exam revealed a well-developed, well-nourished female with blood pressure of 120 over 60 in both arms and pulse of 85. She has no evidence of central or peripheral cyanosis or clubbing. Her lung fields are clear. Jugular venous pressure is 9 to 10 centimeters at 45 degrees incline. Her precordium reveals a normal apical impulse, subtle right ventricular lift, S1 single and normal, S2 is widely, pardon me, S1 is single and normal, and S2 is widely and persistently split with no appreciable respiratory variation. There's a grade 2 over 6 systolic ejection quality murmur mid-peaking in the left sternal border in the second and third inner space. Her abdominal exam is unremarkable. Peripheral exam is also unremarkable. Her electrocardiogram shows sinus rhythm with incomplete right bundle branch block. Chest x-ray shows clear lung fields, increased vascular markings, and prominent pulmonary artery shadows. Cardiac silhouette is enlarged. What is the most likely diagnosis? Answer one, ventri ventricular septal defect. Two, pulmonary stenosis. Three, atrial septal defect. Four, patent ductus arteriosus. The correct answer is number three, atrial septal defect. Uh, ventricular septal defect. I kept doing that. Ventricular septal defect was the one that most of you, if I see that right, uh, picked uh, beyond ASD. And the, the tip off there is the physical exam um, and her age. Her age, at age 40, she should have severe. Uh, 
pulmonary artery hypertension, she should be eyes and fingers, we should see cyanosis, clubbing edema. Um, in addition, uh, the murmur uh, by that age should have been uh, almost normalized because the pressures between the two ventricles will be the same and you have a sort of a common ventricle, so you won't have much of a murmur anymore. Um, so I think the, the tip off there, she doesn't have cyanosis and uh, the murmur. Question two. What would this patient um, require next? Answer one, cardiac surgery consult. Two, electrophysiology consult. Three, subacute bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis. Four, reassurance and decrease her work-related responsibilities. The correct answer is number one, cardiac surgery consult. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move on to question three. A 58-year-old male presents for evaluation of syncope. He's experienced loss of consciousness with the exertion of walking up steps. He works as an accountant on the second floor and typically gets little other physical activity with the exception of climbing the stairs to his office. He has noted four months prior that he needed to stop about halfway up the stairs occasionally to catch his breath. He had noticed extreme dyspnea with a pickup basketball game with his son earlier in the month. He has had a murmur since childhood, which was also noted during a high school physical. He takes SBE prophylaxis. His exam showed normal vital signs and slowed carotid upstrokes. Jugular venous pressure was normal. Lung fields were clear. Cardiac exam revealed a non-displaced but sustained apical impulse. There is a grade 2 to 3 over 6 crescendo murmur at the second and third right intercostal space, which radiated into the neck and could also be well heard at the apical position. The ECG showed normal sinus rhythm with left ventricular hypertrophy and frequent premature ventricular complexes. What is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Answer one, papillary muscle rupture. Two, aortic stenosis, secondary to calcified bicuspid aortic valve. Three, benign flow murmur and deconditioning. Four, patent ductus arteriosus. Five, senile degenerative calcific aortic stenosis. The correct answer is number two, aortic stenosis, secondary to calcified bicuspid aortic valve. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move on to question four. What is the next recommended step for this patient? Answer one, referral to a cardiac surgeon. Two, SBE prophylaxis. Three, reassurance. Four, electrophysiology consult. The correct answer is number one, referral to a cardiac surgeon. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move on to question five. A 35-year-old male presents with hypertension. He's otherwise asymptomatic. His exam shows a blood pressure of 190 over 90, a grade two mid-systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur at the right second intercostal space that also radiates into the neck and down into the apex. Electrocardiogram shows normal sinus rhythm and left ventricular hypertrophy. Echocardiography shows bicuspid aortic valve and left ventricular hypertrophy. What is the next step that's indicated? Answer one, diet and exercise counseling. Two, antihypertensive treatment with a beta blocker. Three, antihypertensive treatment with a calcium channel blocker. Four, MRI of the thorax. The correct answer is number four, MRI of the thorax. Well, the patient um, on physical examination, we're giving you a patient who has uh, significant uh, coarctation of the aorta and to uh, try to treat his hypertension and also to uh, try to 
prevent long-term sequelae from this lesion, you'd want to have the patient have the diagnosis first made and then treat, and then treat the problem. So I think that that was the point of the question, is try to, to make the diagnosis of the coarctation. Question six. A 45-year-old female is found to have a large ventricular septal defect. Pulmonary arterial pressures are 108 over 70 with a systemic blood pressure of 110 over 70. All of the following would be expected on exam except answer one, a loud P2, two, cyanosis, three, hemoglobin of 20 milligrams per dill, four, loud grade four, high-pitched murmur with a thrill along the left sternal border, Five, right ventricular hypertrophy on the electrocardiogram. The correct answer is number four, loud grade four, high-pitched murmur with thrill along the left sternal border. The, the, um, the loud P2 is correct because you have pulmonary hypertension, so the, that would not be the, the wrong answer. We're asking you to pick the thing that won't be there. Cyanosis, this, you're describing a patient who has Eisenmenger syndrome, which results in the long-standing, unrecognized, uh, untreated, uh, non-restrictive ventricular septal defect with um, uh, ultimately normalization of the shunting. So you get uh, redu reduction of the murmur across the VSD, and the only murmur that you'll hear on exam now is the uh, pulmonary artery outflow murmur, generally speaking, due to the volume overload of the right side. And you should have cyanosis because of the mixing, as I showed you on that, uh, on that cartoon, uh, between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. I think that was the two main things. Question seven. The above patient wishes to start a family. You advise, answer one, seek genetic counseling. Two, there is a high fetal and maternal mortality associated with pregnancy in this condition. Three, referral to a fertility specialist for consultation. Four, repair of the defect prior to pregnancy. The correct answer is number two. There is a high fetal and maternal mortality associated with pregnancy in this condition. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move on to question eight. This is a 50-year-old farmer who presents with a history of flushing after eating and diarrhea up to 10 watery stools per day. There's been a 20-pound weight loss over the preceding year. He has also noted a gradual decrease in his exertional tolerance due to dyspnea and wheezing while carrying out his normal daily chores. He denies fever, comma, chills, and sweats, but has had a decrease in his appetite over the last year. His exam reveals a ruddy complexion and jugular venous pressure up to 14 centimeters with prominent V-wave in the venous profile. Precordial exam reveals a sternal left tapping apical impulse, normal S1 with physiologically split S2. There is also a loud holosystolic murmur with respiratory variation. The liver is enlarged and pulsatile. There is bilateral lower extremity edema to the knees. The electrocardiogram shows atrial enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy. Echocardiogram shows thickened tricuspid and pulmonary valve leaflets with retraction and immobility causing wide valvular regurgitation. What do you clinically think is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? Answer one, carcinoid heart disease, two, cardiac sarcoidosis, three, hemochromatosis, four, hypothyroidism. The correct answer is number one, carcinoid heart disease. Most of you got that correct, so we'll move right on to question nine. 44-year-old father of two young children presents with a six-month history of dyspnea, leg edema, orthopnea, PND, horse voice, renal failure with creatinine of 2.4 milligrams per dill, and carpal tunnel syndrome. 
An echocardiogram shows massive increase in left ventricular wall thickness to 2.5 centimeters in the septum. All walls are thickened, including the right ventricle. Left ventricular ejection fraction is 65%. All four cardiac valves are thickened, and there was mild regurgitation of all four valves. A small pericardial effusion is seen. Diastolic function is abnormal, indicating elevated left ventricular filling pressures. His electrocardiogram shows sinus rhythm and low voltage. The next best step is answer one, start verapamil for diastolic dysfunction, two, check subcutaneous fat aspirate for amyloidosis, three, neither of the above, four, both of the above. The correct answer is number two, check subcutaneous fat aspirate for amyloidosis. Want to comment about answer four, why yeah. both? Okay. Well, one of the things about uh, that I'm, I'm glad some of you answered that, so I had a chance to stand on my little soapbox for amyloidosis. Amyloidosis, I gave you the hints of carpal tunnel, horse voice, there's systemic uh, disease involvement. But the echo kind of showed you this picture of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and then we tell you there's diastolic dysfunction, and, and many of us were trained that to treat diastolic dysfunction, you start verapamil, but patients with amyloid heart disease will deteriorate with verapamil. Um, it will help a patient with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but most patients with, uh, with this type of situation will get much worse, and it could make their orthostatic hypotension syndromes much worse, which is commonly uh, goes along with amyloid. They have a, a neuropathy that causes orthostatic hypotension as well. So you want to try and avoid that in amyloid patients. Question 10. An 86-year-old independently living patient presents for physical exam with main complaint of fatigue. On exam, her pulse is irregularly irregular at a rate of 96. Blood pressure is 150 over 72. Her exam is otherwise unremarkable. Her electrocardiogram confirms atrial fibrillation. Sensitive TSH is suppressed. Echocardiogram shows small hyperdynamic ventricles, ejection fraction of 70 to 75 percent, mildly enlarged left atrium of 4.8 centimeters. What is the next step in management? Answer one, immediate transesophageal echocardiogram. If negative, then DC 